Taken from the Women's Aid website. Domestic abuse isn't always physical. Coercive control is an act or a pattern of acts of assault, threats, humiliation, and intimidation or other abuse that is used to harm, punish, or frighten victims. This controlling behavior is designed to make a person dependent by isolating them from support, exploiting them, depriving them of independence and regulating their everyday behavior. We campaigned and succeeded in making coercive control a criminal offense. This has marked a huge step toward tackling domestic abuse, but now we want to make sure that everyone understands what it is. Coercive control creates invisible chains and a sense of fear that pervades all elements of a victim's life. It works to limit their human rights by depriving them of their liberty and reducing their ability for action. Experts like Evan Stark liken coercive control to being taken hostage. As he says, the victim becomes captive in an unreal world created by the abuser, entrapped in a world of confusion, contradiction and fear. In 2015, the Serious Crime Act was updated to include Section 76, criminalising coercive and controlling behaviour in UK law. Since then, additional steps have been added to combat this via the 2021 updated Domestic Abuse Act, further extending avenues prosecutors can explore in convicting abusers of varying nature. There is still a long way to go, especially regarding the coercive control within groups. But someone pivotal in informing these laws and making this systemic change was a forensic social worker named Evan Stark, who literally wrote the book on coercive control. Coercive Control, How Men Entrap Women in Personal Life is a key text on my current master's degree at the University of Salford. The title of the course is The Psychology of Coercive Control. I have had this interview in the bank for a while now, but as we are exploring domestic abuse and intimate partner violence this week on the course, it finally felt like the right time to share this very special interview with you. Here is none other than Evan Stark. So hello Evan and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to chat with you ahead of my enrolment onto the Soul First postgraduate course, The Psychology of Coercive Control. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Well, fine. I'm Evan Stark. Um, I'm a sociologist and a social worker and I've been doing this work on domestic violence for about 40 years. And before that, I did other things. Um, but uh, I'm a retired professor, and I continue to do a good deal of forensic work, which means that I testify usually on behalf of women who are charged with serious crimes committed in the context of themselves being abused, often murdering their partners or in situations where their partners have killed children most likely uh, in the throes of uh, also abusing them, but where they have been charged because of their apparent complicity in the crimes. So I do primarily criminal cases. And as I'm sure you know, Casey, and maybe your listeners know, um, I'm very involved because many more countries in many US states are acting course and control laws, various versions of which have something to do with what I've written. Um, and I continue to work on course and control. My newest book will be out in a few months. It's called uh, Children um, of Course of Control. And it basically argues that we should be applying the same broad framework of constraints to how children are being abused and neglected that we have applied to women who are abused and neglected, and that these crimes are almost always committed uh, by the same persons who are abusing the women and not by the women themselves. And I'm hoping this book will have a dramatic effect in shifting the burden of our current child protection services, which will focus largely on mothers 
as neglectful or drug abusing or psychologically deficient parents and on the criminal behaviors of the men who are actually physically harming these children in the context of harming their wives. What an impactful and incredible career that you've had. I really am humbled to have the opportunity to sit here and talk to you today. I've spoken to forensic psychologists and forensic psychiatrists, but never a forensic social worker. This is the first time I've even come across that title. Do you have an idea of how many court cases you've assisted in up to this point? No, I am probably in a lifetime in criminal cases. No, I would say somewhere around a hundred, maybe more. Um, I also do family cases. We also do civil lawsuits. Course of control is now because it's been enacted in about 15, 16 American states, including California and New York. Uh, which are larger states, um, it's very often I'm called on by um, plaintiffs in lawsuits now because there's civil liability for coercive control. Uh, I don't usually accept those cases. I've only been involved in a half dozen. And usually I'll take the role in those cases of simply providing the court with information rather than assessing a client. In my forensic social work practice, I actually do extensive interviews with women, sometimes with children, um, often hours and hours. And we're, we've been very, very successful. As you know, we, we brought a, a, such a case in the Sally Shallon trial in, in London, and uh, Sally was uh, released. Um, with time served. Uh, the court didn't officially recognize course control in that case, but it was clear that that was the new evidence that established the grounds uh, for her release. In the last six months, uh, I've had several clients who had life sentences in U.S. prisons uh, where they've been convicted of uh, contributing to the homicide or otherwise death of a child, been release from prison or have their sentences reduced to time served. So I think the courts have become very much aware that liberty and restrictions on liberty are critical factors in why children are allowed to suffer in these situations without being protected. They used to blame mothers all over the place because they had drug problems or alcohol problems. or you just, But when you looked at these cases more closely, you saw that uh, the women's own protective facilities had been uh, denied and had the police or had the state interfered appropriately early on to remove the source of liberty uh, denied, the children would have thrived and been okay. So, uh, you know, one thing I think it's very important for you to understand and people who um, share this podcast to understand is that coercive control is part of a larger global movement for women's equality. That we wouldn't even be having this conversation about why are we talking about other than physical harms to women and children, if women hadn't been able and children hadn't been able to establish their voices in arenas other than where the physical was brought to bear. So the fact that women now are assumed to have dignity or assumed to have equality, in part because they have to work and they have to provide for their family and they go to school means that the ways in which those dignities and liberties are denied can have the same status as they have had for centuries for male-bodied persons. So, in other words, if you understand what I mean, so that it's not that coercive control is a new idea. It's that coercive control is a recognition of the new status that primarily, not only women, 
but primarily female body persons have in the world. And that in order for our society to thrive, we have to provide protections for them. There's nothing uh, profound about that fact. That was one of the most striking things for me when I was reading through Coercive Control, The Entrapment of Women in Personal Life, which is your big, impactful text that is out in the world, has been for a long time, um, which will receive an audio book or has received an audio book. And there'll be a follow up book for Coercive control in children which is going to be amazing no doubt will change legislation all over the world um as it's as it's predecessor I doubt has that, done. I, I, no book does that really but but there's also a second edition of course to control that will be out in a few months with all new case material and and also a discussion of the english and scottish laws Yes, that's amazing. That's amazing. And absolutely something that I wanted to ask you about um, before we, we wrap up today. But the most uh, one of the most striking parts of that book for me was recognizing that because women have begun to have some form of equality and have been able to go out and seek equal job positions and therefore in some cases equal pay, there is another element of financial coercion that is playing a role in a lot of situations where individuals are being abused through coercion. And it wasn't until I I read that in your book that I realized, of course, of course, that didn't happen when, uh, as much I imagine in the 30s, 40s, 50s, where women were predominantly staying at home. That's right. I mean, one of the, I remember yet one of the first men that I had in a men's group that I ran uh, way back in the 1980s told me that when his wife got her first job, he thought he had struck gold. Because literally, I mean, you know, the, the, the man was brought up to believe that the trade off was that he went out and worked and brought on the money and then she spent the money and she, of course, supported him. And all right, men didn't appreciate women's unpaid labor to the extent that it should have been valued. Very few people did. But once women were able to bring in the wage, and once able, women were able to bring in other things from the outside world, so that, so, such as their imaginative contribution to the household and all kinds of other ways, then their value skyrocket, not just the value to the husband and children, but the value to the community as a whole. And of course, for some men, that meant hoarding those resources for themselves. And that became the in embryo of what course for control was. That's right. That it is intimately tied to the women's access to the wage and and to women's desire to use the wage to make of themselves what they what they need to do, not simply to make of themselves as, into the man's wife, but into their own kind of person. And so it is tied to that kind of personhood. That's right. Thing I found interesting that I was reading about on the internet the other day was um, the drastic rise in divorces in comparison to the 1950s. And somebody said, why is it that so many divorces are taking place? And somebody else wrote, because women are realizing that if they don't want to stay in a marriage, then they don't have to anymore. Um, and I thought that that was quite interesting in consideration yeah, it, of your the, writing. The thing, it, the thing about course for control though, is that it's not a domestic offense. Unlike domestic violence, Coercion control is not limited to the home. Coercion control crosses social space. That is to say, not only through the mechanism of stalking, but women who are single, separated, and divorced are at higher risk, actually, wow. than coerce, from coercive control than women who are married. And the use of coercive and controlling tactics, such as stalking, such as intimidation, such as, you know, uh, use of the children, such as use of the courts, uh, 
uh, you know, all kinds of things, surveillance increases with separation and divorce. So separation and divorce are no uh, guarantee. And, and I mean, the idea, for example, and that's one of the reasons I wrote this new book on children, because the idea that somehow the course of control ends when the marriage ends, quite the contrary. Couples may never live together and yet be totally controlled and manipulated because of the technology, what technology allows us to do today. During the COVID epidemic in England, we would hide people hundreds of kilometers from the homes that they fled. And within days, their partners had identified where they were and were threatening them, threatening their families, threatening their neighbors, and so forth and so on. So the kind of protections that we have to put in place with the policing of coercive controls goes way beyond what we anticipated in terms of family law. And it's true, I mean, it, it, women's increasing access to divorce was a major incentive to men's devis devising technologies of stalking and electronic intimidation that allow them to move thousands and thousands of miles. Creates tremendous problems for our refugees. Of the phrase coercive control, do you have a tidy way of summarizing what that means? And can you tell us how it was that you fell into this work and into developing this framework around coercive control? Well, coercive control, I mean, in simple terms, it means making you do something you don't want to do, making you be somebody you don't want to be. I mean, that's an intuitive grasp of it. If if somebody in a relationship is systematically on an ongoing basis denying your personhood, regardless of how you define it, that is an abusive relationship. Now, in, in the law, there is a number of elements that distinguish course of control. It's not simple. First of all, it's a course of conduct, not a single act. Course of control is an ongoing course of conduct. It's not like domestic violence. It's not a push or a shove or a curse or a, even, even a single act of stalking or intimidation. It's a strategy like embezzlement or kidnapping that has a beginning and an end. It goes on. Second of all, it has multiple elements. Physical violence is important, as it is in all forms of abuse. About 75% of all course of control has physical violence. 25% does not. But what's interesting is that the physical violence in course of control is different than the physical violence we learn to anticipate in domestic violence. For one thing, it's not the broken bones that we typically see. That may happen. But course of control is characterized by violence that is low level, the pushing, the shoving, the grabbing, the belly barking. But it's ongoing. It's sexual. Parts of the body, it's aimed at the breast, the head, the face. And it's cumulative in its effect. We don't judge coercive control by the fact that it causes injuries. I did research years and years ago that showed domestic violence was a leading cause of injury to women. My wife, Ann Flitcraft, and I did that research at Yale in the late 1980s. It became very, very important in putting domestic violence on the map. But if you wait for injury and coercive control, you miss 99% of it. Coercive control is noted, the violence is noted by its cumulative impact in the sense of the victim feeling subjugated and controlled. So violence is important, sexual abuse is important. But again, the sexual abuse, while it may include rape, much, much more common is what I call rape as routine. 
Well, she doesn't say no, not because he's physically intimidated her, but because she's been so subjugated that refusal is not any longer part of her vocabulary. So even though she's not being physically forced to provide sexual favors, her options have been so restricted that she's no longer a free sexual being. But sexual abuse and course of control runs the gamut from rape to all kinds of forms of harassment and sexual humiliation and degradation. The book is filled with it and we're learning to deal with it. But the point is that it doesn't look like rape. The The victim of rape and sexual uh, of uh, classic rape does not look like the rape victim of course control, who looks just like every other person out there. And if you wait for the rape victim to surface, you miss 99% of it. That's why Scotland, unlike England, has a separate category of sexual assault under the course for control law because they want police to realize that the rape victim, the sexual assault victim in force and control is experiencing that sexual assault on a continuum of, of denying of sexual rights. But in addition to the violence of sex and physical violence, sexual violence, the elements of force and control that are new are the isolation, cutting people off from all of the moorings from which they derive their identity, their school, their children, their families, their neighbors, their supermarket, their bowling leagues, their employment, everything that they take for granted and out of which their identities develop, they're being cut off. They're not being cut off by not being allowed to go to school or not being allowed to go to work or not being allowed to go to the gym or not being allowed to go out with their friends but they're being isolated at these points of contact because their cell phones are being tapped, because their computers are being tapped, because their coworkers are being harassed, because the car is waiting outside for them. So they're isolated in the midst of all of their socializing. He's at the, the kids' games. He's watching while she's getting the award. She's being monitored in the midst of all of the things that she's doing, but she needs to be free in order to be herself. So isolation is critical. And intimidation, in addition to isolation, he's making her afraid. Again, it's not just traditional threats, but the look and the glance, the very eyebrows, letting her know that he can have access to a pocketbook, have access to her children, has access to her neighbors or her private possessions or her deepest secrets. Intimidation that shows that he knows how to hurt her and make her afraid in ways that nobody else does. And finally, course of control is characterized by the element of control itself. He's controlling her money. He's controlling her food. He's controlling how she does her housework. He may be controlling how much time she spends in the bathroom. I have lists in my possession that I've taken out of families where there's been a homicide led to courts and control, where every item in the house is, is, item, is detailed how she should perform the work. No micromanagement is too small in courts and control. I have those lists in my book. I have those lists. I bring them up all the time. And the judges can't believe that. And the woman can't believe it because he never shows any interest in any of these activities. He's not. How, when did he get the time to spend the time on how you can vacuum so you can see the lines? He hasn't vacuumed in 25 years. But yet the point of the detail is not that he's obsessive, but that by squashing out the last bit of liberty, she cannot refuse him control over the resources in the household the money, the time off, the drinking, the girlfriends, all of the things that he takes from them. So those five elements, the violence, the sexual abuse, the intimidation, the isolation control. And of course, there's also the psychological abuse. But what I want to make clear, and, and this is where England really cut off on the wrong foot. I mean, it's a long story. I tell it in the new book, the new edition where Theresa May went from being a home secretary to being prime minister. And 
the, when she brought course control with her from the home office to turn it into law, the lawyers all said, well, look, the Solicitor General said, well, look, we have all these things already in England. It's a crime to rape someone. It's a crime to beat someone. It's a crime to threaten someone. The only thing we don't have is psychological abuse. So they made the course control law in England originally, S76, they called it, psychological abuse. But the point they didn't understand was that psychological abuse, calling somebody a name or making fun of them, only hurts as much as it does when the person is disabled by other means of deprivation and control from responding. If someone calls me a name and I can call them back or I can walk away without fear of what's going to happen to me, I'm not going to be psychologically abused. I'm not going to be tormented simply because he stays in the room and torments me. Just because I think I love maybe some people can. I know there is dramas on television where, you know, maybe the archers that happens, but it, 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 it's not real. In reality, psychological abuse, the foundation of psychological abuse is the materiality of deprivation and control. So this is why we're talking about this as a liberty crime. And it's not a simple, it's not a simple crime. It's why, even though we've made it a serious crime in, in Scotland, now more and more serious in England, now in Wales it's a serious crime, and many other countries and US states is becoming a serious crime. It takes a long time to enforce because they spend a lot. It's like kidnapping. It's like any kind of conspiracy. It's not easy to take a person's rights away who's been cultivating those rights and liberties even for 14 and 15 years. They've been getting used to it. Yet to take a person, and it doesn't only, I, I, we've talked about men and women. It happens men and men. It happens to women and women. It happens in all kinds of settings. Course of control is not a gendered crime. What makes it gendered is the fact that the most devastating context in which it occurs is the context of sexual inequality. But it can happen in any context. It happens in corporations. It happens in, you know, in, in a variety of settings. Probably, probably more than you wanted to know about that, but... I could just listen to you talk about it all day and of course because of the work that I do I'm linking everything that you've said in in, in that last segment back to cultic environments that that I've come to learn about over the last few years so it's incredible for me to hear you talk about it with such passion but also such knowledge as well and you mentioned the serious crimes act introducing coercive control would you be approached personally when they're looking at changing legislation in certain countries to offer input or guidance on any of those things? Well, I worked very closely with the people in South Wales recently when they they implemented their law. And we certainly were involved in discussions in England. And my colleagues, Cassandra Winner and, and uh, Nicole Westmoreland and many, many other uh feminists in England who are legal scholars as well have been working very closely with the government. But this is a very complicated issue. Again, it's not... Look, Scotland got it right. But it doesn't mean it'll turn out right. I mean, now that the PM has resigned, you know, in Scotland, and we had we got the vote for coercive control in Scotland, 132 to nothing. I mean, you know, that was quite... And we had one of the chief barristers in, in all of Europe take charge of training the police. We had the chief prosecutor of physical in Scotland, you know, really take the law under her wing. Uh, 
you know, and we had the wind of the women's movement at the back. And still, it's an incredibly difficult crime to enforce because these guys are incredibly evasive. They have money. They move from one town to another. Uh, police have all they can do. It's not, it's not a matter for local policing. Basically, domestic violence policing is nowhere compared to white coercion control it involves specialized high crime policing. So the simple fact that all of these things came together is no guarantee that the law will be effective. And sure, we work with them, but it's more a question of just linking the larger equality agenda to these new laws. If we pass new laws, but we don't give new employment opportunities to women, or we continue to restrict their access to pregnancy control, or we don't provide real refuge for women who need shelter, or we don't give them the kind of daycare options they need. Women won't have liberty as an option to choose. So course control is part of the equalities agenda, but it's only a part of the equalities agenda. And it's only as strong as women's equality is realized. And we could eliminate course control with full equality, it'll be eliminated, except insofar as individuals continue to carry it out. Right now, it's a systemic offense because equality is inequality is systemic. Another striking part of coercive control for me when I was reading through it was there was a, a, a part that mentioned that there's a generation now that finds the prospect of domestic violence um, being normalized a really strange concept because it's been uh, there's been legal changes. It has become illegal for people to hit people for people to put violence onto other people um but at some point in the chronologizing of uh the women's movement you spoke about and detailed how that's not always been the case well are you asking me whether in domestic violence has always been to uh, problem. Well, we've we've waned, and uh, that's gone back and forth over the centuries. I mean, there've been periods when domestic violence was heavily condemned in England in the eighteen seventies, for example, when Francis Powell Cobb first wrote "Right Torture in England." It was very heavily uh, condemned, but of course, in those days, wife torture was considered to be. Uh, primarily in the working classes. Nobody conceived that it took place in the middle class, let alone in the Houses of Parliament. You know, and there were other periods during the 1920s and during the 1940s. And again, during the 1970s, when we did our research, I think there was still an understanding that hitting physical violence was still the cusp of the way in which women's insults were being experienced. But as women told us in the shelters, and as the first woman, I, I mentioned this in my book, the first woman we hid in our house before we had opened up a refuge. When I asked her to talk about the violence, Donna told me, violence isn't the worst part, wasn't the worst part. And I didn't know any better. I said, talk about the violence, Donna. Talk about the violence. So she did. She told me about the hitting and the bruising, and I was like, oh, that's terrible. And we put faces of bruised women on our posters and so forth and so on. And then, you know, Nicole Brown Simpson or somebody else, you know, uh, didn't recognize her face on there because she wasn't battered and bruised, didn't get black eyes, but she was insulted and her integrity was taken away and uh, she wasn't allowed to drive and she couldn't go to work and her dignity was you know, diminished and, you know, her career was stifled and Angela Heard, you know, and and in and, and the case. And the, so we now put on the poster a woman whose face is not blemished and bruised. 
And pretty soon then we will, will recognize that that is not only because it's psychological and physical abuse, but there's also a social dignity involved that we're not just talking about physical violence, we're not just talking about a woman's right not to be insulted, but a woman's full right to personhood, which is a social capability, and not just an individual capability. It doesn't just mean I can be safe. It means I can be free and I can become what kind of person I want to be. So, I, you know, these things evolve. Law evolves. Justice evolves with our sense of who we can, as society evolves, and we go backwards too. I mean, nothing to prevent us going back to a time when violence was simply, we were grateful to be free of violence, alone, to have a right to wear what we want to wear or have the kind of sexual identity we want to have. That's the, that's the wild thing for me though, because I I turned 30 this year and I can't imagine living in a time where it's kind of common knowledge that there is inequality in the home and outside of the home where people will just be subjected to violence, let alone coercive control in in separation to that. Um, so the section in the book about, you know, there is a generation now that that is kind of surprised that it used to almost be normalized that that would that that would happen in society. Well, look, I'm I'm over eighty, so and I've lived through a time when I thought abortion was a right that women had, and it could not be taken away. And now in the United States, there are fourteen states or more in which a right to abortion is no longer there. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if your right to be free of violence. When when our son uh, went through his transformation, there was a right. Now, in many, many states, the right for people to choose their own sexual identity is being abrogated. So, of course, we go back and forth. And, and the march is not a march always to progress. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, each generation dies out the other generation has to learn the lessons that of what we took for granted. So if you're lucky, you take for granted rights and liberties that your mother could not. And, you know, we, as I helped establish those rights and liberties that you could take for granted. So you have to make it so that your grandchildren can take for granted the rights and liberties and even demand more than you had for you. Having such an impact and making this your life's work, it must be frustrating for you when you feel like progress is being lost and we're almost going backwards in, in some ways. Well, I don't know. Is it frustrating to finish a meal and have to eat again? I mean, I, it, look, you know, the, the joy the joy is in watching people enjoy the the victories and the successes that they have when they hear. I don't, I don't, I'm not naive enough to believe that I live on earth for other people. I live on earth for myself and my family and my friends and my sisters and my brothers and all the compatriots in the world. If I, if I could make it better while they're on earth, then they, their children have the obligation. And if not, too bad. But you know, that, that's the best we can do. I don't think I, I don't think of human betterment as a project I've taken on for all of humankind. I just think of it as a way to make life better for today and tomorrow. I know that people will turn the pages of history and do the same stupid thing they did 50 years ago in World War II or 30 years ago in whatever war it was. And I'm not at all surprised that politicians and our leaders do those things. And you shouldn't be either. But the 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 fact of doing justice, the act of doing good and making change is infectious. And the march toward freedom and progress over the millions of years we've been on Earth seems to have taken us away from the cave. So whether or not there's one step forward and two steps backwards, I kind of have faith where 
marching in the right direction. You mentioned in your emails to me that there would be a, 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 an opportunity to discuss your activism work that has taken place uh, around the world. And I wondered if you could just talk us through a bit more of what that looked like. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what I was referring to. I thought, I think I was referring to, I mean, I, I was, before I got involved in this, I was an activist in the anti-war movement in the U.S., and the civil rights movement in the U.S. And this this sort of came, this work with women and domestic violence sort of came to me when I had to get a job and raise a family and basically needed to find work. And my wife and I, my wife's a physician and fluid craft and a feminist. And we carved out a position for ourselves she did as a physician, I did as a sociologist in changing the health professions in the U.S. to make them more aware of domestic violence. And we succeeded in doing that. We we got President Reagan on board. We got the U.S. Surgeon General on board. We got President Clinton on board. And that was one part of our activism. A very important co-part of our activism was opening bad women's shelters. We were... We, visited Pitsy soon after she opened up Cheswick House in London. We helped work with refugees in Glasgow and many places in England and, and, and many of the pioneers in the refuge movement were brothers and sisters with our movement in the US. Um, we had thousands of refugees in England and the U.S. By the late 1970s and 80s, we had swept the globe. We had refugees in Taiwan. We had refugees in, we visited refugees in Amsterdam. We visited refugees, we knew we had refugees in China. You know, the, this was an international movement. And we feel very proud of that. And nothing we've done, you know, contradicts that. I do think that we've come to a point in the refuge movement, where we need to look beyond refuge, and we need to look at the, the I think the COVID epidemic made this abundantly clear. When people had to shelter in place, it made it evidently clear that we had to establish a sense of place for women that was broader than just the insulation of the individual family. And to define the community of women as an active space of recreating us, themselves as a larger and larger force, clearing that space of men who insisted on taking away their dignity, but including in it men who did not, but men who recognized that dignity and women who recognized the purpose and dignity and making that a bigger and bigger space. So I think... The, the idea of activism and its unification with law and justice has become an increasingly important part of my life as I've gotten older. And But we, we've never not been activists. Now I can't walk so well, so, you know, it's more active on the screen. Listen, I have to go because I have a, a, a client waiting for me who's in bad need of support. She's facing a life in prison. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Evan Stark, for your time today. I will make sure that I put links to your book in the episode description, and I will let listeners know when your new edition lands for coercive, inc uh, for coercive control I appreciate of that. women in personal life. And I will also make sure to let the listeners know when coercive control in children and lands. Let as me well. make an ad. Cassandra Weiner has a new book on course control that's just coming out. And we're going to be in London in a few weeks to kick off the publication of this new book on, on the new law in England and course control. So look, uh, make your listeners aware of that. Thank Absolutely you very will much. do. Thank Kate you so much, Evan. And, and thanks Enjoy for your Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> That is the end of this episode on Coercive Control with Evan Stark. To find a copy of Coercive Control, 
how men entrap women in personal life. You can follow the links in the episode description. For CrimeCon tickets, you can do the same. And to get in touch with me, you can find me at cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at cultvaultpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, host of the Cult Vault Podcast.